I've been actually quite troubled by this shooting. I think uh, most of us have been. Yeah, and uh, you, you know, yeah, because it it was so big, so so many people killed, so many people wounded, uh, it uh, utter massacre. Mm -hmm. But uh, you, you you know more like that constant role of similar shootings, uh, you, you know, Sandy Hook and uh, Orlando yeah. and uh, and it goes on and on. And many of those we don't hear about because they were somehow a little smaller, fewer people were killed or uh, I, I've been, uh, I lived next to a place where something like that happened. It was two blocks from my church there and uh, yes we did uh, vigils and we had healing sessions and all of these things but you know I can understand uh, people who are saying enough is enough and this is becoming uh, just a cliche or something like that like those thoughts and prayers ah, and yes. here we go you know and and uh, then people who are complaining like this are being accused of being insensitive or being being insensitive, being not spiritual enough, not mm -hmm. understanding it. But I must say, I'm a I'm I'm a theologian. I'm a pastor, and I have my questions about it, and I'm seriously disturbed about it yeah. because I consider that almost like an abuse of religion mm -hmm. you know or abuse of prayers because you know what should prayers be in this situation okay. uh, there's two things that come to mind when you talk about the the ever non-stop uh, thoughts and prayers that people constantly talk about uh, one is that I remember with this happening, when Orlando and the pole shooting happened, uh, when we've had so many other tragedies, I remember there being a call for when people said thoughts and prayers that it was more than just you were hoping things would get better or that you were just sending up prayers, but that your prayers were actions. Mm -hmm. That it was one thing to sit in a room and to pray about something, which is not necessarily a bad thing, but also yeah, that absolutely. if we wanted the world to be different, that we had to use our prayers to motivate actions. The other thing that comes up is I was, I was reading on Facebook, it's nearly impossible to be online right now and not see some information about this or some think piece about this or some new new article about the victims mm -hmm. or the perpetrator or whatnot. But I saw someone, uh, one of my seminary classmates, who I believe is a chaplain, mm -hmm. and they talked about how powerful prayer is in moments where there's nothing left to do. When mm -hmm. someone is in so much pain and so sick and mm -hmm. nothing has worked, and you're at this moment where the only thing you can do is just to be there with that person and with the God and to lift those prayers up for them in hopes that something will happen. Mm -hmm. And they said, this is a paraphrase, that to look at a situation like this, when there is still so much to be done, yeah. when there are so many changes that can be made and there are so many actions mm -hmm. that we can take, that our leaders can take, and to only offer up prayer, that's not right. I, uh, to me, it is almost like an abuse of religion to, to, to some degree, because what I have observed and what I saw is really that this is offered as a solution, mm. uh, those thoughts and prayers and vigils, and that should not be it. You are right when you cannot do anything more, I think, prayers are marvelous because then you will discover a new openings like with our immigration situation here when the doors were shut on immigrants and we had vigils 
uh, but it led into formation of our resistance bureau and, and, and many other things in this church. And so that, that is where vigils have meaning, but just offering only vigils seems to me being uh, dishonest. Yeah. I remember um, when we were having our troubles getting our um, second refugee family mm -hmm. yeah. in, and yeah. we were holding vigils and things like that for immigration, for refugees, how I remember people's reactions to them mm -hmm. and talking to church members and some community members about how that was a healing space. Yeah. And I think that's really beautiful. I think it's I think it's wonderful for people to be able to come together in times of tragedy and pain and to experience one another, to grieve with one another, to grieve with God. I think that that's a really important aspect of self care and of community care. Mm -hmm. And also what I noticed in that is with our community distraught and grieving, once they had that chance to be able to come together and to express their pain and lift it up to the Lord, it made it easier for us to think, okay, now that we're feeling a little bit better, now that, we, now that the pain doesn't quite have the same sting, what can we do next? There is, it opened new possibilities, exactly. or the opened us to see new possibilities, yes. you, you know, and that's, that's exactly how it should be. Yeah. Yeah. And it healed people enough that they were able to act, yeah. that we didn't just get stuck in our pain. We took time to take care of ourselves, and also because we took care of ourselves, we were able to take care of other people. And I was really struck by another dimension, and that's when I think that action is more appropriate than, uh, than just uh, thoughts and prayers. Uh, um, when, when, when I thought about, uh, you, you know, how diverse all these situations are, uh, predominantly, you know, uh, what are the backgrounds, what might be the motives. Uh, newspaper gave me the final jolt when it said police hunts for motives. And I said, you know, motives are so diverse for all those different situations. But what all these situations have in common is easy availability of guns and ammunition. That's what is uh, the most common to, to all those things. I actually have noticed that another thing they have in common mm -hmm. is it's almost always men. Yeah. Um, it is almost always white men, mm -hmm. um, with these particularly large ones. And I think that that leads to a discussion on, on how toxic masculinity is really affecting us. This idea of mm. being super duper masculine and being very fragile. If you are challenged in that in any way, you have to be the strongest, the toughest. You cannot be rejected. You have to push away anything that challenges you, push away anything feminine. Mm. Mm -hmm. I think that that's a really important factor in this. And when we look at the way that society functions, the people that tend to be on top, the people that tend to get the most praise, and the people that tend to not be able to handle any kind of criticism are the ones who lift up things like whiteness and masculinity. Mm. And I think that's a conversation that we need to have. Uh, I think that if we limit the number of guns people get, then we can stop these kind of horrible, violent crimes and tragedies but aggression, it does not take aggression out. Exactly. Yeah. And if, we, if we're able to take out the aggression, if we're able to take out this violence of masculinity, this violence mm -hmm. of racism, then we're not just getting at a symptom, we're getting at a source. Yeah. I think that helps stop people from getting to the point where they feel like they should or they must commit these kind of acts of destruction. Yeah.